Anyway, I'll introduce our speaker. It's, his name is Tony Toynton. Uh, he's a retired as a, a retired uh, as a chief assistant constable of Sussex Police in 2006, and following which he held a board level director position with West Sussex County Council until 2012. And since then, he's fulfilled a number of interim leadership roles with local councils, including things like highways, transport, waste management, street cleansing, and softer communication community services such as public libraries, public records and registrar services. He's also lectured on leadership and management, project management and sound governments at the more senior level in both public and private sector settings. Anyway, so I'd like to introduce uh, Tony. He's gonna to take over from now on. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, the questions and answers afterwards. So. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, uh, for that um, introduction. I'm hoping, hello, everyone. Um, I'm hoping that everyone can now see, mainly on your screen, my first slide, um, and then at least a, a small um, pop out of me um, in, in your, thank you for the thumbs up, Carol, um, in, 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 uh, also. Um, I've got a smarter picture of me so that you can see who you're dealing with in a few minutes, but um, I, I have a few slides that, that hopefully will illuminate what I'm going to say. Um, I promise it won't be reams and reams of text. It'll just be a few uh, photographs, mainly as, as prompts for me, and, and, and hopefully you'll find it um, adds to what I'm going to say. Um, in, in terms of timing, um, I, I'm going to come back to it shortly. I'm afraid I have to leave you at eight. Now, I, I, I've been through, like all good speakers, uh, I, I rehearsed and rehearsed and I edited and I edited and I'd got half an hour to talk or just slightly more and leaving you guys at least half an hour for some questions and answers. And then this morning I did an emergency panic edit because I sort of woke up at some hour in the night thinking, hang on a minute, there's a few things I ought to change. So forgive me if it's slightly shorter or slightly longer than half an hour. Hopefully I won't bang on for too long um, without giving you time for some questions. So, hope that's okay. As Andrew said, hello, my name is Tony Toynton. I'm currently, I have the pleasure and honour of being Chair of Trustees for Sanctuary in Chichester, which is a small local charity that provides pastoral, social and practical, or actually we tend to say practical, social and pastoral support to refugees and asylum seekers in the Chichester area. So my talk today will highlight the role of Sanctuary in Chichester, who it actually supports and why that support is needed. Um, I'd like to thank you um, for this opportunity to highlight our work and to give you some real examples of how we have uh, and continue to make um, a difference to the lives of those we support. I'll give you a little of my personal background, although Andrew has kindly given you my CV, which is nice of him, and experience, but only in its relevance to my role with Sanctuary in Chichester. Now I'm hoping you should get the next slide shortly. Otherwise I've made a right mess of it. I've already made a mess of it, you see? You have to forgive me one second while I stop sharing and then I share it again. I hate Zoom. How's that? So I intend to set out our work um, in the wider context of refugees and asylum seekers here in the UK and to an extent in the global context. But, but this has to come with a health warning because I don't claim to be an expert. The, the knowledge and understanding that I, that I have really just comes from the work that I do with Sanctuary in Chichester. The stories our beneficiaries have shared 
and to some extent the background reading I do that really just to ensure that I'm, I remain as current as I can be on things like law and government policies and the wider policies and practices that affect or have affected the people whom we support. I always see talks like this as an opportunity though to explode a few myths about migrants and migration and maybe give a more balanced approach to the stories and press reports that generally stem from personal or political agendas or just downright laziness sometimes on the part of journalists who choose either not to do proper research and or provide any sort of balanced reporting as I see it. Now, if I say something you fundamentally disagree with, I honestly won't be offended if you say so. And I hope I've left time for questions, as I said, or indeed arguments at the end. First, an introduction to Sanctuary in Chichester. We're a small local charity. And whilst a fully independent organization, we have an affiliation to the UK wide City of Sanctuary charity that helps promote an established charities such as ours, as well as promoting things that they call streams of sanctuary, sanctuary awards and sanctuary schools, all intended to welcome people seeking sanctuary here in the UK. It was established in Sheffield in 2005 and that city became the first formal city of sanctuary in 2007. Sanctuary in Chichester was first established in 2017 when a group of very well-meaning folk recognised a need to provide a focus for such support here in Chichester. In 2019, it became a fully registered charity and it was at that point that the trustees recognised the need for a bureaucrat, i.e. someone that turned out to be me with a background in organisational leadership and management and the bureaucracy, the sort of bureaucracies that must be in place to ensure proper governance and accountability. So here's a picture to show you who you're dealing with, although it was taken a couple of years ago. I'd like to think I haven't aged at all, of course, although I did notice I've got a lot less hair, but that's not because I'm losing it. <laughs> well, I have lost it, obviously, but I'm not balding particularly. Um, uh, when lockdown started last year, I unfortunately broke my leg. So I had a bit of a double whammy and with no hairdressers open we we went to mr amazon who sold us a pair of clippers and my wife's become a dab hand so about 10 days ago when that really hot weather came i said to her for goodness sake get it all off it's too hot too hot so it will grow back but yeah you can see um my smart corporate picture a lot more hair and perhaps a little bit younger and i've got a collar and tie on for work as as we need to do so I was appointed Chair of Trustees in June 2019, uh, as Andrew said, after a career, a career almost entirely in the public sector. Um, I won't repeat what, what, what Andrew has said, but um, just, to, just, just for clarification, I did work for Su West Sussex County Council and I have worked for other large councils, but I've always been a civil servant, not a politician. For some time in the early noughties, I actually reported direct to the permanent secretary, um, again, a civil servant, the most senior civil servant at the Home Office in relation to a multi-million pound investment in emergency services, digital communications across the UK. We did the bureaucracy. So I was able, and I believe I'm still able to ensure that Sanctuary in Chichester has all of the proper financial, legal and governance policies, decision-making, safeguarding policies and practices and meets the requirements of the Charities Commission and our local government partners, particularly West Sussex County Council and Chichester District Council, who hold some statutory responsibilities for the people whom we support. The day-to-day -day reality sees me as general manager though, fundraiser, mover of furniture and stuff, such items when they're donated by our fabulous supporters. We spend and therefore need to raise around £40,000 per year to keep everything running. Plus, we benefit hugely from people giving their time and skills freely. We actively support about 200 people 
many, indeed most, in family units. Every child who comes to the UK seeking asylum as an unaccompanied asylum seeking child, i.e. they arrive here alone or with other children, are the responsibility of the local authority. Done something to the screen, that's okay. And in whose care they remain until they're 18, unless they leave the country. All of our refugees, are cl all the refugees that we support, we call them our refugees because we, we've grown to know and love many of them. Um, but all of them are classed as vulnerable adults in law. So we have to meet a number of requirements, such as every volunteer has to hold a current enhanced DBS check before being allowed to have any access to them. I think at this point it's worth just coming up to help and it may help if I come up with a couple of definitions. I've used the terms refugee and asylum seeker and it's worth just clarifying, I think for the purposes of this talk, to whom I refer for the purposes certainly of our work. In reality, every person who chooses to leave their country of origin and travel to another country to seek refuge is by definition a refugee. Equally, when they arrive in a new country and request asylum, they are asylum seekers. At Sanctuary in Chichester, we make the following de definitions though, simply for practical reasons and to guide our volunteers as to the help they're able to give, because it's different. So for our purposes, an asylum seeker is someone who has arrived in the UK and has requested asylum their claim has been registered by the Home Office and they're given leave to remain in the UK while their application is being considered. If they, or they, if, if they are children, they'll be looked after by the local authority and housed either with a foster family or in a hostel. They have access to all public services, including mainstream education. They're treated in law like any other child who's looked after in law, looked after child by the local authority until they're 18. If they are families with children, they're given somewhere to live by the Home Office through an outsourced contractor, which means really hostels or B&B &B premises. And here in Chichester, um, they have, we have an ex-military admin block that's been converted into flats. It's basic, but it's okay. And we help by adding in lots of furniture and the comfortable stuff. Um, we provide them with broadband um, so that they can, they can they can connect. Again, the children have access to mainstream education, but the adults are not permitted to work or study or claim benefits. The Home Office provides the essentials plus £37 per week per person to live on. They are then signposted, don't you love that word? Signposted to local charities such as Sanctuary in Chichester for all other support. I just want to put that into further perspective. We are currently supporting a, a man, I say young man because he's younger than me, but a man who lives in a house owned by one of our volunteers. And he's been waiting a final decision on his application for asylum for seven years. He's now 32 years old. He's a fit, intelligent, very able young man, totally precluded from making any contribution to the UK apart from basic volunteering whilst the cogs of the asylum system grind slowly towards a decision for him. You may recall under a previous Home Secretary, the one who became Prime Minister, the Home Office was instructed to adopt a hostile environment to their systems. And in that I can tell you, she succeeded. Now, a refugee on the other hand is a person who requests for asylum and their request has been considered and accepted by the Home Office, and they've been given the right to remain in the UK, either indefinitely or for a specific period, which is normally five to 10 years, five or 10 years, sorry. And during that time, they're permitted to live effectively as a British citizen. By far the majority of the refugees we support here in Chichester are families who have fled the war in Syria, uh, fled to initially to refugee camps in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, um, or Iraq. 
And then under a scheme called the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme, SVPRS for short, which was established under the UNHCR um, to get families out of the camps and now living in the UK. In 2015, the UK government announced it would accept 20,000 of the most vulnerable and with the support of local councils, such families have been given visas to come to the UK and given five years refugee leave to remain. This is a great scheme. And I'm proud to be a citizen of this country when it agrees to do such things. I'm also aware though of how small that figure of 20,000 is when you consider the following. According to the charity World Vision, now in its 11th year, the Syrian refugee crisis remains the largest refugee dis displacement crisis of our time. Since the Syrian civil war officially began on March the 15th, 2011, about 6.6 .6 million Syrians are refugees. 6.6 .6 million people fled to other countries and about 6.2 more are displaced within Syria. And about half the people affected by the Syrian refugee crisis are children. So government provides local councils with money support to support the first year's settlement costs, following which they provide councils with £5,000 per person per year until the end of year four, when the figure is reduced to £1,000 per person. So it's a sliding scale. We're not sure what will happen after five years yet because we haven't got there. We've asked the Home Office several times and they haven't given us an answer. Um, we can talk about that later if you'd like to. But what then is needed, of course, is the practical, social and pastoral support that is provided by Sanctuary in Chichester. Because in general, when refugees arrive, they arrive with what they're able to carry on their journey, which generally amounts no, to no more than clothes, photographs and a mobile phone. Many of the asylum, the asylum seekers, of course, that are not on those schemes that I've described for our refugees, travel on the clandestine trafficking network and often arrive with just what they're wearing and can carry. I'll leave it to you to imagine how much that might be because yes, yep, we're talking about people smuggled onto small boats, the backs of lorries, and other clandestine means of entry. I think you can read that. I'm sorry, our little thing is... Well, that says in 2020, the UNHCR Global Trends Report put the total number of refugees around the world at 26.4 million. You can come up with your own comparison on that. Um, the, the, the population of London, as you know, is probably around 8.6 million. Population of England is somewhere around 50 million, I think. If you add Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, I think we get up to something like 68 million people in the UK. At the moment, the estimation and, and the Global Trends Report has been around a long time. Its, sources, its data sources are pretty reliable. 26.4 million people currently refugees around the world. I'll give you another slide shortly to break that down. What I'd like to do before I do, though, is just now come to my myth busting bit. And if I rant a bit, I do apologise. But sometimes it takes my blood boil when I hear people talking about some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Forgive me if you're already au fait with what I'm going to say. Um, I find when I do talks like this, a lot of people armed. Um, the term illegal immigrant, we hear it all over the place, mainstream media, social media, the term bandied about, often by those who seek to stir up tension and hatred, but it's also, I think, repeated by those who are just lazy in repeating what they hear others say without thinking about checking whether it might be true. Migration is never illegal. Now, people trafficking may be illegal in some countries, but the trafficked commit no offence. It doesn't matter how nefarious the means used to enter the UK, people who do so are not guilty of any crime. It's my understanding that the only time a migrant can be considered illegal 
is if they overstay or break the terms of their visa or permission. Just the same as anybody who comes to a foreign country and they break the terms of their, their visa. There are a small number of people we believe who arrive completely under the radar and don't register a claim for asylum. They're just living completely under the radar in the UK. And I think that probably makes them illegal too, but I'm not an expert. Now, interestingly, at the moment, the government have something called the Nationality and Borders Bill going through Parliament. And that's seeking to actually criminalize the trafficked. I was looking at a couple of press reports this last week, um, one of which suggests that, that most of the migrants, 99% of the migrants in this country know who the big wigs of, of, of trafficking are, it says. And, and interestingly, the government's official consultation talks about making it a crime to be involved in trafficking people. Um, what we, we believe and, and what many of the, the bigger charities and aid agencies believe is actually, um, first of all, that seems to be putting the onus back on the traffic, the most vulnerable, um, that they're the ones that know who does it. Um, and, and, and we don't believe that's the case. Most of the stories that we've all got is that when people decide to pay traffickers, they first of all contact somebody they know and trust who knows somebody, who knows somebody, who knows somebody. But also that very often because of the way that our borders are policed and not just ours, but the whole of Europe, it, it could potentially close off really the only means that people have to escape. And it's not illegal at the moment, but government are suggesting that it should be. And we're opposing that. Um, in our own small way by writing, writing to our MPs and things like that. So whilst on the subject of numbers, let's look at another of the myths. And I'm, I'm being kind to call them myths. I know because there really is a dark side to the propagation of such misinformation, but I genuinely believe that many people repeat them without really thinking. The one I hear regularly, and perhaps you do too, is they all want to come to the UK because we give them free benefits. And just referring back to a, an article in the Times last week, and if you if you read it, you'd be forgiven for, for, for thinking that actually the number of illegal crossings at the moment was, was increasing and we were facing a tide. Um, actually, the, the official figures suggest that crossings are down by up to 40% at the moment. I'm going to change the slide. This, I think, puts that one into context. Of the 26.4 million people believed to be refugee around the world, 6.7 million are in Europe. I'll not read all those out to you, but just point out the one I'm at the bottom. There's believed to be of that 6.7 in Europe, so 6.7 million in Europe, 132,000 in the UK. So they're not all wanting to come here, are they? And if you're an adult without children and you come to the UK, it's just that 37 pounds a week and a bed in somewhere like Napier Barracks or a similar holding center. And then you wait and seven years I'm told is not unusual. People end up in limbo land. So whilst it's difficult to reference any clear authority, organisations such as Sanctuary and Chichester have reached a conclusion that refugees choose a new country based on one or both of two factors. First, they speak the language. And second, they already know someone living in that, con that country. And the latter is by far the most prevalent. Most of the refugees that we support don't speak very good English, but they've chosen to come to the UK because they already know somebody who's here. I'm going to use this slide twice. I'm going to use this slide just to, 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 to point up what we do. And I'm going to read that out to you at the moment. We can talk about, I'll talk about some of the um, headlines um, in a while. 
Um, I'd like to talk to you about one of our refugee families, because uh, most of them are from Aleppo, um, which until 2011 was the second largest um, city uh, in the country, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and within a population of four and a half million residents, it's estimated there's about two million left. Now, I'll talk about my friend Ali and his partner and two children who were secondary school age when they arrived. Ali, I, he knows I'm, I'm talking about him to you. His name really is Ali. <laughs> there are so many Ali's in the world, you couldn't identify him. Um, he said, please don't show people another picture of Aleppo, my, my city that I was born in and loved was bombed out. Show them a nice picture. So here is a picture of the Citadel, which is the UNESCO World Heritage Site and largely escaped, largely escaped the devastation. Ali lost four brothers and his father in the war, came to Chichester three years ago with his family on the SVPRS. On arrival, we allocated, as we do with all families, two befrienders, who met them and through various interpretation apps established what practical help we could give them to help them be and feel safe after many traumatic years because we know they spent three if not four years in um, a refugee camp in Lebanon. We also helped them with the basics like how to register with a GP, where the local supermarket is and which one is the cheapest, you know, do we go to Lidl or Sainsbury's? How does the public transport work? The list goes on. We also help them with who to trust and who to look out for. Chichester is a great place to live, but for someone who has brown skin and is perhaps Sikh or Muslim, there is little cultural or social infrastructure, such as there may be in, in Crawley or Portsmouth or, or Southampton. We run, or we did until lockdown, and we just started again a drop-in centre which we hold in St Paul's Church Hall on a Monday afternoon. And around 60 people, refugees, volunteers and others gather to chat, maybe have an English lesson, help with homework, share stories and share food. So returning to Ali and his family, it's a success story because with our help, on top of the English lessons provided by government, we give them one-to-one -one English support and their English is really improving such that both Ali and his partner have now secured work. They're coming off benefits. The two children have gone through university, one university and one college, and of course they too have, have secured work. And our strategic aim therefore is not just to provide the basics and the practical and the, and the early doors. Our strategic aim is actually to help people gain independence from charitable support from the support by government because we believe that many will have to want to foot, establish themselves as UK citizens in the future and make a new life for themselves after what they've had so far. My second very brief, um, and I'm conscious I'm running out of time, my second very brief example is a young man who did come on the back of a truck from Eritrea, as he, he, I'll call him Jay, um, as a teenager, he was fostered by a family who, who actually sometime later became one of our major founding trustees. Jay has been passionate about football since as long as he can remember. And it turns out he's quite a good player. He's, and he approached our, he's learned good English at school. He, he approached our, our trustees a couple of years ago and said, why can't we have a refugee football team? And we said, I don't know. Why can't we ever have one? So we do. It's called Nations United. We're supported by the University of Chichester, who provide us free access to their pitches and coaches. It's a, it's a, it's a, a mutual benefit. They have, they have um, undergraduates on sports coaching courses. They provide us with free access to their pitches and we play matches in a local league. And we see it for everyone, not just about kicking a ball and scoring goals. They do play in a local five-a-side league and do pretty well. Jay is now our team captain and deputy team manager. But of course, sport provides so much more when we're looking to help people develop skills for life. We help them with risk assessment, health and safety, conflict management, 
regulation. Sport needs coaches, referees, trainers. And so under our tutelage and the lead trustee, who himself is a passionate footballer and, and five-a-side um, coach and referee, Jay has become captain, deputy team manager, general good man. And he's at, just before his 18th birthday, he was given the formal right to remain. He's had an apprenticeship with West Sussex County Council, and we just secured him a place on a, on a unique access course which will help him hopefully move on to a degree course at Chichester University in, you guessed it, sports management. And so last but not least, I just want to talk to you about lockdown and what we do, we did, because here's my confession. I'm 64 years old and I hate Zoom. I hate Zoom, not because I haven't been able to adapt to it, but because all the people skills I've developed and used successfully in my life so far were largely based on face-to-face -face contact, team briefings, meetings, training sessions, connecting visually, sometimes physically with people, and then lockdown took that away. So I was worried that we might leave our already vulnerable families even more isolated because it's fair to say the majority of our volunteers are also in the sort of age and cultural bracket that I am, and I couldn't have been more wrong. With the help of a part-time member of staff who has an IT background and a retired IT trainer, and the purchase, we purchased some um, basic tablet computers for all the families. We had a homework club, we had English lessons, we had a kids club, an art club for children and adults. Imagine if you don't speak English, you haven't lived here very long, you're still trying to work out what the school system looks like really. And then government says to you, you've got to get your heads around homeschooling. I don't know about you, I've, I've got friends who've got school aged children. People who've lived like me in the UK, they really struggle with it. I have to say, with the help of our volunteers, virtually through Zoom, our English teachers, we've got some GCSE qualified trainers, and just running clubs online, the children that we support have done just as well. And I just don't take it from me. The feedback from local head teachers when the schools opened up again was fantastic. We provided 10,000 hours of support to our families on Zoom throughout lockdown. So I'm going to stop there. I could go on and I think I, I'm trying to listen to myself. I think I've probably started a bit wooden and I think I've become a bit passionate. And I hope that's how it's come across because I am passionate about our volunteers and the, the, the welcome and help they give to people, some of whom have been the most vulnerable people in the world. People who've lost everything. Ali, Ali's partner said to me oh, a couple of years ago now when I first met them, Tony, we weren't rich, but we weren't poor. We had a building company. We could help others. We had a nice house and we were doing OK. And then the war came and Ali's, two of Ali's four brothers joined the um, what's, be, you know, what's called the rebel army, those that opposed uh, the president and Aleppo became the center of bombing and they literally lost everything. They packed whatever bags they could and they fled across the border into, into Turkey and, and lived in a tent basically. So they moved from a sort of a nice middle-class house running their own business, kids at school to live in a tent. And through the fantastic work of our volunteers, not through me, We've helped them navigate this hostile environment. We've helped them understand what it's like, what, it, what we need to do to live in the UK. And hopefully we've just helped them recover a little bit from some of the trauma that, that they suffered prior to coming here. So look, I hope what you've said 
what I've said, some of the facts I've shared, some of the case studies, have been at least interesting. Thank you, you're still here. You haven't, you haven't logged off. So um, I, I presume I've captured your attention. Um, I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity. Um, and if I've managed to gather some additional support for our work, then I will have used my time successfully. So thank you. Um, I, I, it's, I, according to my watch, it's 7.42. So I'm going to hand back to Andrew. I'll stop sharing the slides so that we can all see each other. And please, if you do have questions, and indeed if you want to challenge me uh, or argue with me, um, I'd be very happy to. And if I can't answer the question that you ask, I'll be honest enough. And if there's things at the end that, that well, after I, I, I have to leave at eight, if there are things that you'd like me to, 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 to share or whatever, I'm very happy to stay in touch with Andrew and share them so that he can share them with you uh, through your own communication channels. So I'll stop talking now. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Tony. Oh, great. Okay, so uh, yeah, so um, we've got the chat. Um, I've got my chat window open. If you want to open your chat window, you can see any questions that anyone wants to ask. I can't see all of the uh, people here because there's only a limited number of um, windows you can see. So if you want to ask a question, either raise your hand uh, or, um, or put something in, in the chat. Uh, you can either write the question or just say you want to write the question, uh, ask a question. And don't forget, you have to unmute, unmute your microphone if you want to talk, because they're all muted at the moment. OK, over to, over to you. Uh, well, while people are typing their questions, Tony, I'll, I'll ask one myself. Um, uh, yeah, why, why do the refugees particularly come to Chichester? Ah, good question. Thank you, Andrew. Um, they, they come to Chichester because um, the, the, the SVPRS is a, is a voluntary scheme, uh, i.e. voluntary for councils who are housing authorities. So um, the Home Office sent a message to all local councils that are housing authorities, Chichester the housing authority, West Sussex isn't, but they work very closely together, and asked them if they'd be prepared to provide a home for a number of families, and if so, how many? And Chichester District said yes, they would, and they would house up to a maximum of 20 families. So they then, um, when they've secured a house through their housing providers, they tell the Home Office they've got a house or two or three. The Home Office then tell the UNHCR volunteers out in Lebanon or Turkey, and they select a family based on the criteria, and they basically carry out the Home Office um, application whilst they are living still in the refugee camp and then the Home Office feed back to the local council we have a family it's mum dad two children this is the age and the um, the local council councils come together with the voluntary sector and largely it's us and a couple of local churches here in Chichester and we all agree who will meet them you know, simple things who will meet them at the airport we allocate befrienders, we try and find out what they might need in advance, um, and we decorate the house, make sure it's nice and cosy, and it's got more than just the basics. You know, we've got a telly, and it's got a microwave, and it's got some broadband, and um, because what, what's, what provided, uh, I think I said in my talk, it, it's very basic, a bed, a chair, a, a dining table, and not even pots and pans. And so we, we get a bit of notice, we probably only have about two weeks, the family are coming and we um, make sure that when they come, someone meets them at the airport, they have the befrienders to meet them at their house. The house is fit for purpose, it's clean, recently decorated, fit and, 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 and they can immediately start to settle in. Thanks very much. I've got a question from Dodie and she says, how many refugees are there roughly in Chichester? Oh, thank you, Dodie. I don't, I don't know. We support about 200 people in total. Now that figure fluctuates. Um, there are currently um, 12 families on the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. So that's 
roughly about 50. There's eight, around about 80 unaccompanied asylum seeker children in West Sussex. I don't know how many are actually in Chichester. Our football team sees about 30 young guys every week and they're largely from the Chichester area. Then we're currently supporting three families who are waiting um, in, the, in the hostel um, that I um, described, who are waiting for their decision. And they're all two parents with two children, except one is a father and two boys. And we're expecting two Afghan families to come. And we know that they're two parents and one child. So we sort of talk about 200 people. But of course, there may be others that we don't know. It was very interesting when we opened our drop-in centre a couple of years ago. Um, we knew the Syrian families that were here then, and we invited them. And the, initially, there was more volunteers. But it was a case of you know, open the door, and people came. And suddenly, we discovered we were fifty or sixty every Monday afternoon. So I think we can work on two hundred that we know. And so, therefore, I can estimate there's probably around, perhaps another hundred people actually here it's a really small number and and i'm sorry barbara i overheard your chat before we started you're right there are very few brown-faced people in chichester and yes they do suffer racism every time they walk down the street because we're not the most tolerant of cities um and we certainly don't have the sort of infrastructure as i described in my um my report that would help people settle particularly if you're from say a, a Muslim or a Sikh background, where previously probably a lot of your social um, infrastructure and support came from the mosque or the Gurdwara or the temple. Does that answer your question, Dodi? Thank you. Any other questions? Because um, uh, there are none in the chat at the moment. So um, uh, if you want to ask a question, that, oh yeah, here we are, is the one from Liz, um, she says, Thanks for the info. You said that refugees in Chichester don't have as easy access with respect to their religious beliefs compared to, for example, Portsmouth. Are there links to mosques, etc., in these other areas? Yes, yes. I mean, there, there is a mosque in Portsmouth. There is a mosque in Crawley. There are two mosques, I believe, in Brighton. And I think there's, a, there's an Islamic centre in Worthing. Yeah, there's a mosque um, in Worthing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's also a Sikh temple in um, Portsmouth because we were supporting a Sikh family who um, we connected to the, um, uh, the, 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 Sikh, the Sikh, it's called a Gurdwara, isn't it, um, hmm. in, in Portsmouth. And in the end, they, um, the, the temple sorted them out at a house swap. So they're now living there, which is fantastic. Um, so... We don't have a mosque in Chichester, and of course, travel. Um, very few of our of our refugees uh, can drive, and of course, public transport is not that easy or uh, or cheap. Um, I, I have to say, I don't have any religious belief in myself, but I have huge admiration for the Christian churches, even the cathedral, as grand as it is, because they have really reached out and welcomed um, the any of the families that, 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 that want to um, want to go and, and be connected in whatever way um, that they can. Um, but at the moment, um, there is nothing else in Chichester. Um, and I don't know whether the mosques have been very good with getting their, um, whatever, whatever you call it, services online. I do know that some of the Christian churches have. Um, we have some families out at Tangmere and I know that Tangmere Church, because they tell me, have, have, have a sort of virtual, church service or whatever it is um, on a Sunday morning. Does that answer your question, um, Liz? Well, I can't see Liz's face. Yeah, we can't. That's one of the problems, isn't it? You. you can't see them all. <laughs> yeah, she says yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Peter, uh, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, Tony. I, I come from Portsmouth and I'm involved with Friends Without Borders, uh, which works with uh, um, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, we have a 
well, one thing about Portsmouth is it was one of the local authorities that didn't um, uh, didn't offer housing to um, uh, to the to the refugees from Syria, and um, to its shame, really. Um, so we 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 have contact with. Uh, um, a large number of of, of, of of asylum seekers and refugees, but by and large they're not they're not from Syria. Um, but I, I do have some contact with other other areas, and and I'm <clears throat> I'm in touch with a family in um, in Aran District Council. They live in Littlehampton, um, and <clears throat> that's that's if Chichester's a very white community, Littlehampton's sort of blanched beyond uh, belief, um, and and and. Do you do? I think my question is: Do you do you reach out be, be beyond Chichester to uh, to other areas where there might be isolated um, isolated Syrian families? Thank you, Peter. And you could have done this presentation, had I known. <laughs> but yes, um, yes, we do. Now we have to be careful because a, a as a registered charity. Um, you probably know this Peter yourself but others may not you have to be very definite and specific about the area the geographical area as well as the area of, 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 of charitable work so our our um, terms of reference if you like with the charities commission says that we provide practical pastoral and social support to refugees and asylum seekers in the Chichester area now we support a family in Petworth and we support and I I think I know the family you're referring to in Littlehampton because we do support a family um, in Littlehampton. Um, I, I, I don't think Aaron um, have any other than just that one family and they came to our drop-in. So yes, we do provide some support, but we, we, we are very careful that we mustn't offend the terms and conditions of our, um, of our uh, charitable registration. And, and, and of course, the way we, we, we support people elsewhere um, is through people like, like your good selves, Friends Without Borders and the International Rescue Commission. And there is a, a Sanctuary by the Sea in Brighton, who are a fantastic organisation. And there's, there's a similar organisation in Crawley. And we, 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 we also, of, of course, um, help with... Um, with, with linking to, if, if people need help, linking to the mosque and the Islamic centers, et cetera, um, in the area. But, but we are fairly specific about spending our money and our volunteers time and effort, et cetera, in the Chichester area. And, and could I just ask, since the, um, the drop-in, you, you've reopened the drop-in uh, after lockdown, and are you finding that the same numbers of people uh, are, are coming to that as, as, as there were before the lockdown? Not yet, not yet. No, we, I mean, it opened um, on Monday, first time. We've been having a limited, um, in Priory Park, when the weather's been good, we've had some families um, after school, playing a few games, having a chat, a bit of a picnic, just to, just to get people going again, test their confidence. Um, but Monday was the first one we opened and 30 people came. including a new family that we'd never met before. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Peter, uh, Peter, for that. Um, by the way, I've just discovered, I, this is, um, I hardly use Zoom, I use Google, but if you click on the top right-hand corner of view, you can actually see everybody. So it, you just choose gallery view. So if you want to see everybody, so if you want to just raise your hand and speak, um, there's not many here, so that's probably the best idea now. Okay, I, I guess if I may, I have time for one more question before I have to sign off. I've got lots of questions, Tony, so I'll ask one because <laughs> you, you're going to dash off. Um, are there any, uh, have you ever had a, a refugee uh, family or individual that is non religious that's applied to you? Or are they all uh, religious, uh, one way or the other? Um, that's a really difficult question to ask, uh, to answer. Um, yes, I believe so. 
but being as I understand it, forgive me, I'm not an expert. Um, I, I'll tell you when, when I was a senior police officer, I well, not not that senior actually. During the troubles in Northern Ireland, I I spent uh, a short secondment um, in in Northern Ireland, and there was a story there that everyone shared. And you've probably heard it. Um, the story is um, a, a, a guy from England or a person from England arrives at the airport in Belfast and is picked up by the taxi driver. And the taxi driver says, "Are you are you Catholic or Protestant?" And the the, the English person says, I'm an atheist. And the taxi driver says, yes, but are you a Catholic atheist, atheist or a Protestant atheist? You probably <laughs> and, and, and I genuinely believe that, that um, um, I, I, so therefore I, I think in, in many Muslim countries and, and be, be, being a Muslim or being a Sikh or, or be, be, it's more than just religion. It's more about social, uh, you know, it can be a social identity. And of course, in, in many, um, Islamic countries, it's very dangerous to say you're an atheist. We do know that some people have escaped uh, that type of, of oppression. We have a family from Iran, uh, and Iran, you cannot say you're an atheist. Um, and we have a young guy from one of the African countries who, is, who, who tells me he has no religion and also he's bisexual. So that was a double whammy for him. And he now lives in Chichester. So I'm sorry, I can't give you anything clearer on that. The answer is, I believe so. Um, what might be useful is if, is if after this talk, we may, we may share some, some information about the humanists. And if people want to pick it up and, and make contact, I think that'd be great. Yeah, well, that, that'd be fine. Yes, yeah, I mean, as you say, Chichester has got a very, uh, um, uh, hasn't got a, a great deal of uh, my, minority ethnic uh, residents. So uh, uh, I live actually near Crawley, so um, which is uh, uh, you know more opportunity to pursue that kind of thing. But yeah, that we're 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 open for everyone. Yes, and uh, at the moment, of course, we're only meeting online. But there we are. Okay. Well, look, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to sign off. Um, thank you for listening again, and and I'll sign off by repeating what I said. I guess you, you're going to continue your chat. If, if something comes up and you would like me to share an answer with Andrew um, through an email or however Andrew and I talk, I'm, I'm more than happy to, um, because I really do want to, um, to, 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 to share the detail of what we do, why we do it. And I am a bit passionate about some of the myths that I talked about earlier and, 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 and trying to put some balance to the, the really loud, uninformed, dare I call them racist messages we get from all quarters, including our own government. Anyway, that I must stop there. That's that little bombshell I'll drop. Um, I, as a civil servant, I've never been allowed to, to, to join a political party, but of course I do vote and I won't tell you who I voted for. <laughs> Thank you again and, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much, Tony. Great talk. Thank you. Well, um, if, you, if you want to all unmute uh, your microphones now, we could just have a chat if you like, uh, reactions and anything you want to say, say really about anything really, you've got to, because we're supposed to go on to, we're it's allocated to late 30. It needs to be let in. Can you let oh. Kate in? To oh, right. out yeah, sorry. Yeah, I can see you up there. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, it seems like a great, uh, great service they're providing. Uh, you just don't think about it. And I mean, I don't live in Chichester, but you just don't think about someone like Chichester uh, hosting refugees, particularly. Um, and as someone said, you you hardly ever see uh, uh, someone dressed in Muslim dress and so on. Uh, Barbara, if, if you're talking, you need to un unmute. Um, let me. I don't know whether I can unmute everyone. Um, hmm. Oh yeah, I'm, I can unmute. Ask order. Yeah, so you need to press your microphone, Barbara. Where is it? Where is your microphone? There we are. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you very much. That was interesting, and you know, I I have a number of friends who do already help with sanctuary and at St Paul's and things, oh. and I in fact got to know one of the 
migrants fairly early on. But um, so I just wanted to have a catch up with what was going on. And mm. thank you very much. Uh, well, I think thanks. I should go now. Right. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Um, but by the way, uh, in case I forget, um, we, we have another event um, next month. Um, I think it's the 25th of August. Uh, um, it's a Wednesday. And that's all about humanist uh, celebrants, so about uh, humanist ceremonies, uh, births, weddings, and funerals, and other ceremonies. Um, we've got a couple of well seasoned celebrants coming along to, to talk about uh, non religious ceremonies. So you're very welcome to come to that as well. Same process. You have to register on Humanist UK. Who have you got um, coming to that? Who are There's the some, Well, there were two, uh, and there will be two, but uh, the, at the moment, um, there's now only one because the, um, the the mother of one of the celebrants has just, just died uh, yesterday, I think. So that's very sad. Mm -hmm. So they dropped out. Uh, but it's Holly Austin Davies. I, I'm not sure if anyone knows. And I think she does weddings. Uh, so you can. You can decide as a celebrant whether you want to do any or all of the uh, ceremonies. So, uh, Mark uh, Mark Adams, he's the one who dropped out. He did he did he does uh, does all of the ceremonies. And Steve, some... Steve, who does the Death Cafe, he might be quite good as well. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, well, you can two two or three, yeah, be fine. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. they've got a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, yeah, so that, I think it's always uh, very. Uh, um, it's very positive uh, having a talk. We we we've had several, haven't we? Um, uh, um, Kate, mm -hmm. case case disappeared. Oh no, 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 you haven't. Oh, yeah. It's like uh, it's like check is this, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. How did um, people hear? Oh, did you want to say something, Jan? Oh no, okay. I was just seeing my microphone come on. Um, how did everyone hear about this um, this talk? It's always interesting to find out how people know about it. I think I'm with Friends Without Borders, and um, I think um, the chair of Friends Without Borders invited us. Ah, okay. And Friends Without Borders, that this is a similar function. Do they prefer to perform, uh, Jan? Yes. Yeah, it's similar. Right, and based in Chester or Portsmouth. Portsmouth, Portsmouth. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. I thought there was a sanctuary in Portsmouth as well, but um. Must yeah, have there is. Oh, there is. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's a city of sanctuary. Ah. Okay. Um, and also, we have Friends Without Borders, which runs a drop-in, and right, lots okay. of other things as well. Yeah. Wow, that's a great service. Yeah, it must be very rewarding to to do that. Hmm. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, he, I mentioned, uh, um, Tony's mentioned that uh, they communicate uh, with uh, apps, you know, um, some kind of um, uh, rather than having an interpreter. So they have an interpreter app. Is that correct? Do you, do you do that as well? Oh, I don't know. No, what when people drop in, do they, they, they speak English in, well enough when they drop in, do they? Um, no, we have English classes for people who don't speak that well. Um, and we have some people who translate. Um, I don't know about an app though, I'm not sure about that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, uh, one, one thing that, um, I, I'd, I'd hope that he was going to stay a bit longer, but uh, I, I'm not sure he could have answered the question because you, you probably hear about um, now and again people that uh, uh, are sent back by the government, uh, and sometimes they are uh, atheists or non-religious, and they sort of fear for their lives, or, or as he said, gay, um, LGBT, and uh, you never seem to hear about these people that they're, they're deported and. I just wonder whether anyone's following up what happens to them when they go back. They seek asylum, get, you know, fail, and then they get sent back. And has anyone got any information on that? Um, 
a bit worrying, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot that there's a lot that's worrying, really. Hmm. He mentioned also about writing to an MP to um, opposing this strange idea that if you're a trafficked person, you're now going to be illegal because you must have contacted the trafficker, which is illegal uh, because you're encouraging trafficking. So that seems bizarre. <laughs> Yeah. So I think that might be a good idea. Um, we could write a letter to our MP and um, uh, I, I think Sanctuary and Chist have got a website, so maybe they've got a link on that to send a, an email. Mm -hmm. Any other, anyone else want to say anything? I'm yeah, and um, the sports, the sports centre that they were oh. able to I thought it was great about the sports centre that they were playing. That was a really good idea. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Looked well organised, didn't it? Mm. Mm. We do, we do, um, we do gardening as well. Um, in in Portsmouth, we do like gardening club, um, and we've got an allotment. Um, oh. Right, great. We're looking for new ideas all the time. Um, we've got there's, there's loads of, and there's quite a few different charities that work in Portsmouth. As Asylum Matters, um, they run a bike scheme where volunteers, where refugees do voluntary work, um, and then they can get secondhand bikes, which help them mm. get to their work. There's there's lots of different layers of of help in Portsmouth. Uh, Lots of opportunities. I suppose you you are always looking for volunteers as well, are you, Jen? Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, and then Tony was saying that some of the um, some of the refugees become volunteers, and and that poor yeah. guy who's been here seven years and all he, all he can do is volunteer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's just awful, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it just puts people's life on hold and. You know, some people spend years and years reapplying. Um, and meanwhile, they're just living in limbo, as he said. Mm. Yeah. Well, with that activities like yours, at least they can get out and do things, so, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not a lot, but it's just, you know, we're just trying to think of different ideas to help, really. Mm. Mm. But people do, they do um, appreciate, you know, the, the few things that we do. Mm, mm. So you're always looking for other ideas, are you, local activities uh, for people to do? Yeah. 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 Uh, the allotment sounds a great idea. I, I manage an allotment and, uh, yeah, it's very, I could do with uh, half a dozen refugees to come and work on, because it's a huge area I manage. <laughs> I mean, it would just be absolutely ideal. I, I live in a village that's the, Bit of a downside. <laughs> oh, so you haven't got you haven't got many refugees near you, then? That you Not, could. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Crawley's up the road. I, I should get in touch with Crawley and see what they do. They must have quite a a big um, influx. I'd imagine it's the, it's the ideal place because it's uh, I think ten percent of Crawley are either Muslim or um, Hindu or whatever. Yeah, so it's got a quite a big um, proportion of uh, ethnic minority groups. Oh, yeah. Lots of people have to. Oh, sorry, you go. No, no, no. I was just listening to you, Jan. Go on. Oh, sorry. I thought there was someone else talking. I heard an echo. Lots of people have different ideas. Like there's um a farm near us. Um, I've forgotten the name of it, but they they've come up with an idea. Um, it's about being inventive, really. They've come up with an idea where they've run a couple of um workshop days um, and they do woodcraft in they're a farm and they they must do lots of other things as well they they're doing woodcraft days and, and some refugees um, from Portsmouth they're taken out um, I think it's the, the chair our chairwoman I think she drives them out there in a van um, and they do um, some they're doing some woodcrafting um, I think last time they made a spoon or you know just a bit 
bit of basic woodwork. Um, and they're going again this Friday. Um, and I think they're going to do a, they might set up a six week, like once, once a, one day a week for six weeks, they might set up a course for them. It's different people having different inventive ideas um, and liaising really, you know, you hear about people and like, um, today I heard about, um, I got it on our WhatsApp group, there's gonna be a dance class for asylum seeking, asylum seeking women. Lots of people just get ideas together, you know. Yeah. So to try and help. So it's nice that there are people that want to do this because you hear so much negativity. It makes you feel good that there are people at the opposite end of the spectrum to, mm -hmm. you know, to being nasty. There are other mm -hmm. people that want to help. Mm -hmm. You don't hear so much about it, do you, really? Well, no, that's right. And it's like out of sight, out of mind, isn't it, as well, unless you actually meet these people. And how would you meet them? You know, you just do, you know, it's, yeah. Um, it well, I suppose I only met them, I only met them through the drop-in, started mm. volunteering there, and then you meet people and you it sort of snowballs then. But, yeah, I suppose you wouldn't unless you went to one of these places. Mm. Yeah. Can, can I ask um, if um, if they can't work and um, they want to do voluntary work, how how can they do voluntary work where there's where they need a DBS? Is that a, is that a real problem for them, Jan? Where they need a DBS? Did you say? Yeah. But how is it difficult for for refugees or people with refugee status to get a DBS to be able to go and if they're not allowed to work with paid money and they need and want to do something of value and use their skills, they could be a volunteer. But can they volunteer? Because is it difficult for them to get a DBS? Uh, just can I just ask what, what a DBS is because I don't know what that is. Oh, it's the um, it's like the old um, it's the disclose it's the barring disclosure thing that you get when you have to be working with. Uh, any okay. rule. I can't think of actually the the um, acronym stands for. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks. The disclosure barring service. I think it's called. Um, well, um, I know that I know a couple of um, people who a few people who are refugees or asylum seekers and they were I think there are certain rules I'm not clear on all of them um but I know some work in a, the Sue rider shop for example maybe I don't know if you need a DBS to work in a shop I'm not sure I know you would if you work with children um, um some of them do because in our where we have the drop-in it's in a church and the church garden um as, as well as I run a I run a um, allotment, but also I help in the, we have a gardening club in the garden of the, where we have the drop-in. So it's the garden of the church. So we're doing weeding and simple gardening. So that's within, so you won't need a DBS check for that. Um, and we're always looking for new ideas. As you say, I think, I mean, I have to have a DBS check, but um I'm not sure if you do to work in a shop or may maybe, yeah, because I don't know how you couldn't have one, could you? So maybe. I, I don't know. I guess that's my question. It would it yeah. just be like they're in some awful catch 22 <laughs> yeah, exactly. where they've, they've got all these skills and talents to offer. They can't do paid work. We could be having such a great uh, volunteer, you know, service from them. It's a win-win situation, but I just didn't understand whether they would be able to come into schools and help out. I, I doubt they can, which is dreadful. I doubt they'd be allowed to come into a school, but um, yeah, I know that some, I know that people do volunteer. Um, and then it, we've got another um, organization that works with us. It, it's within City of Sanctuary called Asylum Action. And they were, um, so, it, the lady who runs Asylum Action, she organises them um, to do voluntary work and to get the secondhand bikes, which is donated and made safe by um, a grant from, there's all different grants and things that um, happen. Um, so I'd have to ask her actually, I don't, yeah, so they go to places where they don't need a DBS check, because I know, was well, say in in our garden we we don't get a DBS check um, and maybe in in the shops you don't have to have a DBS check I don't know the details of that but um, yeah you definitely can do dot voluntary work because I've heard quite 
I've seen it on TV as well, people working in charity shops that are asylum seekers or uh, actually, I think you have to be careful between the term asylum seeker and refugee. There might be um, a distinction with that. Uh, maybe you've got to have special refugee status. I think I think that's it. You've got to have refugee status. If you've just come over and you haven't got that status, you're an asylum seeker. And then I don't think you can do voluntary work. So there mm. are some rules about it. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, you have to be careful. But yeah, there's so much. And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to, like in our garden club, we invite people um, from the local community and also in my allotment, we, about, we invite people from the community. Like you say, you don't meet people, but we invite them so that they mix, uh, maybe help with language, you know, if, if people don't speak good English, um, we try and get people together so that they do meet asylum seekers or refugees and they do learn, you know, learn about what, what's happening and, um, and they learn that they're not terrible people. And, you know, we're trying to integrate that, that's a, that this, this um, scheme with the bikes and the volunteering that was specifically to help people um, meet each other, I suppose, yeah. Do you, get the, do you get the sense that it's a big shock to the culture difference or, or, are, or are they fairly well aware of life in the UK? Because they presumably they chose to come to the UK at some point. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know that really. Um, I meet people at, at my allotment. We just chat and to be honest we forget about I, I don't ask questions if they want to chat about things I let them chat but I like to meet them we're just there doing gardening and because I know they've got lots of stresses sometimes sometimes people tell me about their stresses um but you're on a, a level playing field when you're doing something with somebody um like we were thinking of having a knitting club as well um if you're, you're doing something arty I suppose you can concentrate on that um, that subject. There's another part of our um, Friends Without Borders who do, um, they do, I can't remember what we call it now, where you meet the clients, the caseworkers, and they have to deal with all the paperwork and um, helping. We give an extra five, our charity sometimes gives an extra five pound a week to people um, if, if they meet certain criteria. and help them with, um, you know, advice and things like that. That's, that, that's the money, that's, that's one side of our, our um, um, I don't know what you call it. That's one side of our friends of that board is I'm at the other side, which is more um, befriending and social and things like that. Um, I don't, I don't, and when I meet them, I, I don't see so much, yeah, I suppose there is a culture shock more with the people who don't speak English um, and who are Muslim, but I, we, often we meet on a, just a human level, you know. Mm. Yeah. So that's I, I, yeah. Yeah, and I do hear some stories like, I know one lady who I help speak English, I help with the languages lessons as well. I mean, she's searching for her husband, you know, the, or the Red Cross is searching for her husband. Um, he's missing in... in um, Kurdistan, Iraq, um, part of Iraq that's Kurdistan. Mm. Uh, and so I don't concentrate on, on their problems. I'm teaching her English. Um, yeah, I'm sure there, there is that. I'm sure there, there must be a, a lot of culture um, shock, but I'm not trying to, you know, mm. if they want to tell me stuff, I let them tell me stuff. Um, mm. On the whole, they to me, they're quite grateful that we're doing stuff with them, mm. you know. So, so, yeah, I was just about to ask on the whole, though, you get on well and they're friendly and uh, maybe a bit shy, but friendly overall. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and especially with the, I think it's nice to have something to do, like the gardening. Um, you don't have to, you can think about more things that are, like we talk about the vegetables and how they cook them at home. Um, and what they use them for at home. It's different to what we use them for. And you, you can talk about the things that 
um, a similar. Um, mm. that, yeah. That'd be a, that'd be a good idea. Cookery, wouldn't it? That's uh, yeah. something that everybody enjoys. And uh, yeah, yeah. wow, yeah, cooking. We don't do so much of that, but there, there's an organisation um, that I found online. That I um, look at. It's called My Grateful, and it's where it's, it's in London at the moment. They might hoping to um expand they say but they get um they get cooks from different countries to um they were doing it online during well they're probably still doing it online before that they used to invite people to their homes um and teach them how to cook a dish from their country and they'd all eat together and mm. there was you know a person from my grateful and official there as well um, i actually bought vouchers for it for my children to do it um, but then lockdown happens. But that's there's so many people with like creative ideas. You, you know, you see out there. Mm. Um, yeah, well, it sounds very good. Um, we haven't got that in Portsmouth yet, but I I do love that idea. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because the lockdown has changed things a bit, hasn't it? Well, a lot, I guess. Very yeah. face to face. Yeah. <laughs> but outdoors on the allotment, that sounds a great idea. That's what that's what's kept me sane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, any last things uh, to say? Um, we're getting close to 8.30. Um, um, by the way, um, if anyone's stupid enough to want to volunteer to help out just to hume this, uh, we need a social media officer and an outreach officer. But you're in Portsmouth, Jan, so that's no good. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, um, uh, and Kate, um, uh, oh no, uh, Dodi, uh, I was just going to ask about our next social event. Have we, have we got, have we, are we working out one at the moment? Any ideas? A sort of pub. Uh, sorry? I, I couldn't I, hear Dodi. I, I was thinking of a pub, a pub meeting. Yeah. But, but at the moment, I suppose it would be outdoors in the pub. And then I'm just thinking, couldn't know the weather's going to be good, so I'm still thinking about that. No. Yeah, we really yeah. enjoyed our walk. That was really lovely. Julia Shepherd was great. Yeah, uh, Kate um, shared some photos of the walk with um, on Facebook, yeah. so we need to put that on the on the website. Yeah, that's a good idea. They had um, um, a guided walk, wasn't it, Kate? Mm. Yeah, and yeah. some lovely photos. It, it, where, where was it again? There, uh, yeah. Kingley Vale. Which is think. west of Chichester, right? North northwest of Chichester. I just want to say how brilliant the um, the my grateful name is. <laughs> that's, that's such <laughs> yeah. a good name. Yeah, I'm going to have a look at that. Actually, I've made a note of that. Just yeah, that. yeah, yeah. There's so many. There's so many websites. Like, um, there's one called Refugee Tales, and they do walks and they have books. They've written books. Um, and if you look at refugee tales and, and they inspired us, we did a walk um, with refugees around Gosport and we're looking to do other walks. Um, we would come to Chichester, but it, it's a bit far because we're hoping that people can come on the bus and things like that. Um, yeah. So there's refugee tales is another one to look up. Um, and or we had a trip to Chichester, actually. We all, um, a couple of years ago, um, we came, it was, um, Organised by Michael, I don't know, Michael is a Quaker, no, he's a Quaker um, from the Quaker Society, but he, he, he used to be our chairman um, and he organised a trip to Chichester and we all came on the bus, well, was back, we all came on the normal bus but um, with all the refugees and everything. And oh, right. yeah. um, there's a, like a, a, it's opposite the Quaker the, um, place, there's a big field and we went around Sorry, the charity. Park. Yeah. Well, yeah, so we did that. Um, yeah, so we, there's, you know, it's about being inventive, really. Yeah, Tony mm. was saying that they use Priory Park now. Oh, oh, right. yeah. oh, that's right, yes, yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. Football, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think they invited us to do a football team. I'm not sure that we've got a football team yet, mm. but, um, yeah. That's something do, you find it, um, do you find it good, uh, uh, easy enough getting volunteers? Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think we always need more volunteers. 
And also, I, I suppose I haven't mentioned another part of our, a big part of our, because um, I don't get involved in the, the money part and everything as well. We have, you have refugees and then you have, you get refugees who get refused. They, they, they have all their, um, they, you know, they, they go through their appeal system and they hit a blank wall um, and they become destitute. So we have oh. a lot of people like that. Um, oh, really? And that's the one that, because uh, right. uh, the Red Cross give a little bit of money and, that, and then sometimes we, we give money, um, say five pound a week or something to people who are destitute. So you have a, we have a lot of destitute people as well. It's not just, you know, they don't, it doesn't, yeah, it's very complicated. Um, yeah, we, you end up with a lot of destitute so um, I, how, how is that possible? You, you mean they're just not in the system at all? Yeah, they, they call it um, have no access to public funds. Um, I think I, I have done a little course on it because but it's so complicated. I, I'm not I'm you know, I'm not an expert on it still. Um, as I say, I don't deal in the in the giving out the money side of our, our, our charity. Um, but we, they do get to uh, they have so many they have appeals. Because asylum seekers, as, as the gentleman explained, is, a, is a, um, a legal term and then you become a refugee. But if you become a if you don't become a refugee, you become an asylum see seeker, you're an asylum seeker, but you don't get um, mm -hmm. status as a refugee. You can appeal a certain amount of times, but um, and then and maybe they can try and send you back. Or if you don't want to go back, people, if you, you know, if you're, you know, like because of your sexuality or whatever you can't it's not safe for you to go back some people do just get lost in this system and become destitute mm. yeah it's a whole massive it's a whole massive thing really yeah so some of our people are some of the people we see are destitute and they wow. sort of sofa, um they, they call it sofa surfing um you know they stay at the house for a little while well so, so friends without borders are one of their things is trying to get a property. Um, so it's quite different from Chichester, mm. really. Mm. Yeah. And, and so those people then, they um, presumably the government wants to deport them, but hasn't got round to it. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched the... I, I, I know one of my friends there, He there's a whole issue. Um, it, it was a programme, a, a documentary about um, the Windrush um, mm. Yeah. and where they sometimes swoop in the morning and, and get people and put them in detention and I know one person who who was put in detention um yeah I, I I say I'm a bit I only know bits and pieces I'm not an expert on it all but um yeah I, I presumably the I don't know how come you I stay on I'm not sure how you come you stay in limbo and and the what the government does about that I'm not sure um i think yeah maybe they do deport you or i know there are some schemes where you can have voluntary um we, we go back to your country voluntarily as well they could, they'll pay your fare obviously um but it, it it's it's very involved um the whole system mm. very involved and, mm. and and hostile obviously yeah and they're about to get a whole lot more hostile as well it seems uh, if this yeah. if this bill goes through yeah yeah well look it's 8 eight thirty. And thanks very much for being our second speaker, Jan. <laughs> I don't mean to be, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's very useful. And, and it's Refugees Without Borders, is that right? It's called Friends Without Borders. Friends Without Borders, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so yeah, look, I, us yeah. look us up. Look us up. I'll look you up, yes. I'm going to do a bit of looking up afterwards, yes, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks very much for, for coming. And uh, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, Dodi, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you for coming and um, see you next time. I hope um, okay. Human Celebrants, 25th August. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.